Welcome and thank you for joining us for the webinar, Roadmap to Success and National Societies and Committees, presented by the Women's Health Community of Practice with support from the Liver and Intestinal Community of Practice. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. In a few moments, you will see a poll pop up on your screen. We just ask that you complete this so we can understand how many people are viewing with us today. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available next week on the COP hubs and the AST website. Please note that your lines have been muted so that only the presenters and panelists can be heard for the archive recording. If you have a question for a panelist during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A window in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Questions submitted via the chat section may be missed during the presentation. Finally, at the conclusion of today's webinar, a short survey will appear on your screen. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderators to begin our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, and welcome everyone. My name is Anjana Palai, I'm a transplant hepatologist. And on behalf of my co-moderators, co Dr. Swati Rao and Dr. Celia de Filippis, we're so happy that you're all here. Today, we are going to highlight three very uh, special women in three different fields of transplant hepatology. So I'm gonna start with our first speaker, who is Dr. Monica Sarkar, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at UCSF and an RO1-funded researcher who focuses on women with liver disease, um, including pregnancy-related liver conditions and reproductive health. Monica? Thank you, Anjana, for that very kind introduction. Let me share my slides. And can you see these okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so as Anjana said, I'm Monica Sarkar. I am at UCSF as a transplant hepatologist. And I have a few slides to set the stage um, and really share how I got to where I am, how society involvement really helped to shape that identity, um, specifically my career-based identity. And then just some tips for you as you're thinking about when and how to really decide when it's time to engage in some of this committee work. So these are my disclosures, um, nothing relevant to today. So I wanted to sh start by sharing my early experience. So I joined UCSF faculty in 2013. Um, and at that time I'd had a two year career development award from the ASLD. And I was really trying to carve a path for myself that was research-based. So I'm about 60, 65% um, with a research focus. And then the re remainder of my time is doing transplant hepatology. And I have a dedicated um, women's liver clinic and a co-located clinic for OB and pregnancy with liver disease. And as I started, I was really on that kind of hamster wheel of trying to secure my grant funding. Um, and I knew I needed to get a K-23 to protect my time. And it was really a period when it was very inwardly focused. So this little cartoon schematic of this individual kind of stuck in their office was very much how I felt. And I think for me, connection community is such a cut filling part of my career. And I wasn't really able to tap into that at that time. Um, and so that's something you can provide guidance as those of you who are earlier in your careers, um, as you're trying to think about when is the right time to engage. It wasn't really until I was mid-level that I like to say that I found my people. So I had secured my K-23 and I knew I wanted um, to expand my connections with people and really engage in work that could help me to have some productivity and metrics that were a little bit more instantaneously gratifying. Um, as you know, putting in grants, you're doing a lot of writing, analyzing data. It takes time to really start to see the kind of fruits of that labor pay off. And joining, I joined HUCOP, so the Women's Health Community of Practice, and then ASLD's Women's Initiatives Committee, both at, around 2018. In 2021, I became the chair of the ASLD Women's Initiatives Committee and then rotated off at the end of 2023, and now I'm co-chair of HUCOP. So as I was deciding how and when to engage in these leadership opportunities, I really made sure that I was strategic and thoughtful about ultimately getting where I wanted to be with my career goals. I knew I wanted to be an RO1-funded researcher and be able to transition successfully from my K to my R. 
in the sector of women's health and liver disease. I knew that I also wanted to have more opportunities to speak and do educational programs around reproductive health. That was really important to me, kind of spoke to my soul. It's you know where my passion has been. And then I wanted to have a growing role in really promoting DEI work and leadership opportunities for women. So as I was looking at kind of the goals and the mission statement for WHOCA and the ASLD Women's Com um, Initiatives Committee, it really fits so well with that. But I also had to be super thoughtful along the way about possible opportunities that would detract me from that path. Um, and it can feel really good when somebody reaches out to you and they're like, we think you'd be a good fit for this particular position, but you always got to just step back and, and envision where it is you want to go to go and make sure that you're not going on a divergent path that might take you away from them, that ultimate vision that you have for yourself. So I do want to share kind of the impact um, that you can have when you're doing participating as EC members on committees, as well as leadership opportunities. And that really comes to the um, kind of work products. So I'm highlighting here in the bottom right, this was a program that I put together with Dr. Lauren Nephew, who is leading our diversity committee for ASLD last year. And this was a program that was um, featured Andrea Reed, who's a leader in our field. And she was able to speak about leadership opportunities for women, her experience being URM and kind of managing everything from imposter syndrome to microaggressions. And I just remember being in the room at our conference last year and just seeing the impact of her words shared with the group. And people, you know, had, had tears coming down their face. You could just see how her sharing her journey and providing wisdom to so many people who had similar experiences provided direct impact. And I think for me, it was really empowering. And I think that some of the joy that I get out of this is seeing how beneficial this programming can be for other people. Um, when I was a committee member on ASLD, that's what I had the idea of putting together a proposal to develop a reproductive health guidance on behalf of our committee, because um, we had not had one from ASLD. And so this is probably to date the single piece of work I am most proud of, but really my involvement with a committee allowed me to spearhead this work um, and make it happen. And then as a chair, during my chair term um, as the women on the women's committee is when we really had the initiation, the legislation that was overturning access to abortion care and reproductive rights. Um, and of course, that really spoke to me, the dangers of that for you know our community and our patients. And so we were able to write a white paper that really highlighted the role of hepatology providers in doing more reproductive care counseling, making sure um, we understand how to counsel about access to emergency contraception, more broad access to contraception, how to go about doing that. Um, and then, you know, from AST, so the Women's Health Community of Practice put together this really beautiful couple day conference, um, controversies conference on pregnancy, reproductive care um, for both transplant patients and, and live donors. And this is already culminated in and is continuing to culminate in publications that are going to be really impactful for patients and providers. And so when you're involved in these committees, you get to be involved in programming that can really speak to your own mission, your own goals. And then there's just the joy. So I love this little video. This is a few of us from the Women's Initiatives Committee last year at ASLD. Um, and of course, we're not always wearing ridiculous clothes and dancing, but it really speaks to the joy. And this is kind of who I see myself as now, which is very different than kind of little Monica stuck in her office, just working on her word documents and submitting grants, which is how I felt in a very isolated way during my early years on faculty. Peer mentorship has been incredible for me. I don't think I understood the benefits and the power of that until I became a mid-level. And I've gotten to have learned so much from my colleagues um, in the context of my committee work and also friendships. I am um, a wife, a mom of two boys, and that is above all the most important part of who I am. And it's also been wonderful to meet colleagues and friends in, through my societies that have that kind of shared love and passion. And sometimes we just need to keep things in perspective when our careers are feeling overwhelming. Um, so that's also been a very cup-filling aspect of my participation. Research collaborations, no doubt. I think I've gotten to really 
connect with people who we work similarly, we have kind of similar mindset and are able to move forward um, our research productivity in ways that we couldn't do on our own. And then really opportunities to sponsor, to mentor and get sponsored and mentored. And I think um, now that I'm involved in these committees, I've gotten more visibility and more senior individuals will now think of me for talks and, and available opportunities that I wouldn't have had in the past without that visibility. Um, so really impactful in that regard. And I think as you're asking yourself, are certain positions right for me? It's really going back to that um, vision of your path and making sure that you are first and foremost focused on who you are and want to be in your career and making sure that the time that you're allocating to these committees and that work is going to get you to that goal. And again, it's very easy, especially when you're junior, to be offered a lot of different activities and opportunities um, and want to please others. Um, but you really got to step back and say, is this going to get me to where I want to be? Or is this really going to be a divergent path that's going to hold me back from achieving my goals? And then how to get involved. I'd say all of our society websites are really great at describing what's available. Make sure you know your call dates. I think for um, AST, it's end of January, early February, where there's going to be um, notifications about EC position availability and deadlines. Talk to your mentor, your sponsor, if you have one, your peers about opportunities um, that might be a good fit for you. And then make sure as you're looking into these that you do your homework and figure out like, what is the time commitment? Uh, maybe this isn't a good fit for you right now based on other things on your plate, but maybe it would be a year or two years down the road. And then of course, be bold. I can't tell you um, how many individuals have reached out to me while I've been chairs, and especially trainee members, to voice why they're interested in my committee, how it really speaks to their own passions. And I've been able to sponsor and promote them for really securing some of these opportunities. So don't be shy. We love hearing from people who have enthusiasm and interest in these. So I will stop there and turn it over to the next speaker. Hi, Monica, thank you for an excellent presentation. It's just so good to, and refreshing to see these stories. Uh, I'm Swati Ram from University of Virginia. I'm a transplant nephrologist, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vinita Kumar, uh, who will be the next speaker. Uh, Vinita is the epitome of what I think of a woman leader. And seriously, she's got every award that's out there. She has received it from patient care to mentorship to, uh, to sponsorship. So truly a, a visionary who has helped a lot of women uh, in nephrology proceed to, to their career. So Vinita, please take it away. Swadi, thank you for that incredibly um, kind introduction. And uh, Monica, what a pleasure to follow you. I learned so much uh, listening to you talk, and I wish you were there when I was getting my journey started. <clears throat> so here's a little glimpse of uh, what we are going to talk about today. And um, starting off with my list of disclosures, I don't have any that are relevant to this presentation. I'm just flashing this up um, just to show you there is a huge amount of alphabet soup on here. And how does this become relevant as we talk about um, roadmaps to success in national societies and communities? So let's start with my career story. I grew up in this little part of India called Gujarat, but my family is from the South. So I really grew up in a blended culture with some amazing parents. Uh, that's my brother and he'll hate me for showing this picture. Um, and I went to medical school in India too. And I was firmly um, set to be in India for the rest of my life until I was convinced by this man to follow him. Um, my husband, um, he was born and raised here. And I joined him in San Antonio, Texas at the age of 22. And a year before that, had never even dreamt about coming to the U.S. So this was my first sort of reinvention. I grew up in a certain set of cultural norms. My identity was within those set rules. And going to a new place and rebuilding, um, my, allowing myself to rebuild myself um, and have the freedom of consideration of norms that I left behind and expand perspectives, that was definitely a time for new growth. Um, it's time that I needed to allow myself. 
Um, San Antonio, Texas is where my husband had started his practice so and we didn't want to be apart. So it took me two years to get into residency because I had to finish my um, USMLE one and two. I hadn't prepared in India because I came here right after I got married, right after I finished medical school. Um, and then I um, actually worked uh, for a year as a research uh, in, in a research fellowship position before I went on to become an internal medicine resident at UT San Antonio. And it was actually um, a very eye-opening experience for me, both from an educational point and a cultural point. I was the first foreign graduate they had taken outside of Columbia, uh, where they had a, a relationship and had an exchange program. Um, and starting my internal medicine residency for those three years, I was wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, and would always look up to the faculty and the chief residents and say, oh my gosh, will I ever be anybody like them? During my journey there is when I was um, exposed to the concept of national societies um, and realized what strong bodies they can be. And my homes at that time, those seven years, was Society of General and Telemedicine and uh, American College of Physicians. Um, it's really in those seven years that I sort of learned to be an individual, a physician, a teacher in the U.S. system. Um, and interestingly, I never thought of myself as being a generalist, but I was so enamored after being picked to do a year of chief residency with the concept of academic medicine, because I was um, going to be this person that specialized and went on to be in practice. And during this time, was able to take lessons and courses and how to be a teacher, um, how to talk to people. And um, this, was, it, this was an incredible time, but also it took me about 10, uh, it took about a, a better part of 10 awards before I was able to believe in myself and feel valid, like I actually knew something and had something to contribute. About the same time, I got comfortable with general medicine and now I wanted to branch out and go on and do something more, something different. And um, that's when I uh, zeroed in on wanting to do a nephrology fellowship. And I went to University of Washington in Seattle. Of course, it's a beautiful place to be. But I went there also with the intent of getting an M MPH and MSPH. This was part of a three-year program up there. And lo and behold, when I got there, there were some changes that happened in the program where that opportunity was not available anymore. It was crushing, but within opportunities, uh, within disappointments lie opportunities. And I pivoted and actually became a basic science uh, fellow and something that I'd never envisioned I would do, but it was probably one of the best times I had because I got to learn nephrology from a mechanistic point of view. So I went from wanting to do outcomes research in AKI to actually getting enamored with the kidney and the physiology and the glomerular disease. And it actually between that interest and meeting a patient with a kidney transplant, I fell in love with transplantation. And my mentor there after, uh, sorry, at that time, American Society of Nephrology was my home. And my mentor there, when I talked about wanting to do a fellowship, apart from staying at UW, I had looked around and convinced me that I should come to University of Alabama in Birmingham. You see here that the arrow is actually kind of a curved one. And this curve was meant to be going back to the Pacific Northwest because I fell in love with the Pacific Northwest and would have loved to live there. But around the time of finishing my nephrology fellowship, I was asked to join faculty as uh, assistant professor in 2007. And from 2007 to, 2000, to present day, um, the 17 years from 07 to 2024, I have now picked up a, many more uh, professional homes. American Society of Transplantation is where my heart is. The other two kidney uh, associations, NKF and ASN, are also um, places that I felt at home. Um, and then uh, with my interest that it sort of evolved, um, Schwartz Center Round for Compassionate Care in Boston and Vital Talk that's based out of Seattle are also some of my professional homes. And I'm um, involved in various um, ways with each of these organizations. 
But I want to focus a little bit on talking about the early years, and I call it the 2.0 because I had my early years in general medicine, and this was early years in transplantation now. And this was 2007 to 2012. And this time it was establishing myself, reestablishing myself again at my home institution because I went again, made another transition um, back from teacher to trainee to teacher again to faculty again and had to sort of allow myself to feel like I actually could do this again in a different field, in a different institution, that it was not a fluke. And I show this to say it takes time, um, be patient. Um, it takes time to establish yourself. It wasn't until 2012 that I got my first opportunity with national uh, participation. 2012 is when um, I got to become a member of the American, the, the education committee. During this mid years, while I was doing all of that locally, <clears throat> in those five years, I was able to slowly also do more and more um, nationally. And I just outlined some of the things I was able to do. I won't belabor sort of the details of it, and we can talk about it in the discussion. But what were the best parts of these 10 years? Um, the networking was incredible. Uh, Monica already pointed to that. Um, the network, both within your institution and larger than your local network, the sense of belonging, finding your people, your community, your home, um, learning, learning what is cutting edge, what's best practices, uh, what can I take back to my home, home institution, what can I share back? Um, sort of dissemination of your own work. You have to have done a body of work until then to be able to uh, disseminate it. And I also learned what my personal style of leadership was, which was really a servant leader, which is sort of to be of service to others. Um, I, I, you were gonna have access to these slides, but I just sort of put down a few thoughts of what it was and how did I grow in the organization when I started as a member. But the onus at the end of the day was on me. I got what I put into it. Um, and it required a little bit of thought and planning. Um, but the best part of it was actually coming together with like-minded people, um, similar focus, similar needs, and the willingness to do something that was beyond just uh, what was important and useful to you. And this is a particularly um, if sort of a, a thing that's very dear to my heart. To the right panel is the... Um, we we were the chairs co chairs of the Living Donor Consensus Conference, um, <clears throat> and we had not met each other until then, including Olivia. Our relationship started um, over a journey of a year just through Zoom calls because this was during the COVID era, and it has since culminated into this beautiful home and friendship and relationships um, that go beyond just. Um, the work, um, but the, the combining our works towards the betterment of something else. There are also challenges during this time. Um, the challenges for me were, um, I am naturally not um, assertive if I'm trying to be assertive for myself. I'm extremely assertive if I'm trying to speak up for a patient or for a cause or something that I believe in. And so learning, taking institutional leadership scores and personality assessment types to figure out what are your strengths, uh, what are some of the things that you have to be careful about in how you present yourself or how others perceive you? But the biggest thing was probably the imposter syndrome issue. Now, imposter syndrome being um, defined as self-doubt. I had, despite my background and having had validation externally, I still continue even today have self-doubt of my intellect skills or accomplishment. I'm like, why am I here doing this talk? Because I have these amazing role models, these extremely high achieving individuals, and I can only see um, how far I still need to go. So I had to learn acknowledging worth because acknowledging worth feels like arrogance and the antidote to self-doubt is confidence. And so this is one slide I'd love to sort of show you before I um, hand this over. Self-confidence, um, what I learned was is saying I am good or good enough. Arrogance is I'm the only one good, the balance between the two. Self-confidence says I can get the job done. Arrogance says only I can get the job done. <clears throat> There's a difference. I, didn't, I never want to be on that end of things. Um, and I want to continue to build my self-confidence. Th those are the stories that I, um, sort of the learnings that I had to tell myself. Because at the end of the day, 
self-confidence, the final product of that is success. And arrogance, the final product of that is, destru is destructive, destructive of somebody or someone. Um, the recent past and the years ahead have been extremely fulfilling, and they've been um, poignantly uh, underlined by really what you can give back. Um, my goal moving forward or what drives me is how I can grow the community. And there are certain ways um, to do that, but I will leave you with this quote. Um, I love this quote. It's a Greek proverb. It says, a society grows great when old men, men, women, uh, older people, uh, plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. How simple and profound are these words? And this means good people do good things for other people. So I end by saying, embrace your perfection, imperfections. We are not perfect. We bring the best foot forward, but we all want to do well and do right. And we have family in doing that. So thank you for this time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, for sharing that incredibly poignant and personal story. Um, I'm Celia DeFilippis. I'm a heart transplant cardiologist at Columbia. And I'm honored and humbled to introduce um, Dr. Shelley Hall, who I've admired uh, through since I was a trainee. Um, so Dr. Hall, uh, she's the Chief of Transplant Cardiology, uh, Mechanical Circulatory Support and Advanced Heart Failure at Baylor Dallas. As I'm sure she'll talk about, she's been involved in, in multiple organizations, including past chair of the UNOS National Cardiac Committee, um, she's the president, the first woman to hold um, president for the Texas chapter of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, she's also involved um, in the AST as a board member uh, and look forward to hearing more about her journey. Thank you, Celia. I appreciate those nice words. And the nice thing about being last is I get to uh, skip through stuff that um, everybody else has covered and really get to hopefully your questions. And and so I think that um, my message to you all, all is that career paths are rarely straight, and that is absolutely okay, um, and share my my journey. Uh, these are my um, uh, disclosures. I consult with companies that I think are going to better my field, and I'm really passionate about doing so because if we don't collaborate with them, then they aren't going to produce what we need. Um, so some would ask how I'm qualified. I often ask that all the time. Um, and my big caveats is I've been doing this a long time. I guess they say the oldest for last. Um, I'm in my 28th year and I've seen almost everything. I've been through four surgical directors um, and uh, I'll share some of the things that I've seen and done. Um, so for those of you who know me, I grew, uh, don't know me, I grew up in Cape Cod. Um, I graduated from high school there and then I moved to Texas and I remained in Texas. I discovered I really was a, a displaced Texan. Um, I got married in college, divorced in medical school with one child. Then I was a single parent in residency and then I got married again. And then I've been pregnant and given birth in every phase of career. So med school, residency, fellowship, and first year of practice. And I also have a stepdaughter. So I have five kids with a 10, uh, 15 year uh, span. So I've been through a lot of that. Um, I did all my medical training at one institution, UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, which is unusual um, nowadays. Um, I think we're a more migratory uh, community and, and go around to different places. And all of my practice has been at another single institution, the Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, which I also think is a rarity nowadays as people move around much more. Um, as I said, I've gone through four surgical directors. I've had at least 20 colleagues. I've lost my first one to suicide. Uh, and I've had to go through the pains of uh, firing uh, people or letting people go um, that I may have liked personally, uh, but just didn't work in the institution. And I'm still kicking. Um, and that has a special meaning to me now because I had a stroke last month, which was a very, very scary um, health incident, an embolic stroke that luckily um, with TPA, I have no residual. So I, I kind of broke this up into decades. It's hard to believe I'm that old to be talking about decades, but um, I thought I'd start by em emphasizing your first decade. And I, I think that the most important thing to never forget about is just learn to be a good doctor. 
take care of your patients, be a good partner to your colleagues and learn to be the best you can be in medicine. Um, because ultimately everything else builds off that. And I think that, you know, we, we have trainees getting involved in research and, and trying to do public speaking and get involved in stuff and build up their resume. And they get drowned in all of these, these checklists to do that they sometimes struggle just to keep up with the, the science. And I think that that's important. And then ultimately, I think it's even more important, especially for we women, um, that if you have a child that I think we're even busier learning to be a good mom. And I go back to med schools and talk to med students and they all ask, when's a good time to have a baby? And having done it in every phase of training, I would say, when you want to have a baby or sometimes you get surprised and I've had both. So I think that ultimately um, I, I say you learn to live with guilt. The reality is when you're at work, you're worried you haven't done something that's mother related, whether it's carpool lane or room mom or snack mom for the day. Um, and yet during this first decade, I wanted to be that. And so when I grabbed graduated from my training and went to Baylor, I said, okay, there's only so much time in the day. And, and Baylor's a huge clinical community um, with a, ma at a massive patient population. But we did mostly um, clinical trials as far as enrollment. And so I said, okay, I'm giving up academic medicine. There's not enough of me to go around to be a good doctor, a good mom, and be writing and researching. There just wasn't enough of me. And so I said, okay, I'm giving that up. And that was hard because I'd been trained at an academic institution. But the trade-off was that I was the uh, manager for every soccer team, every hockey team. At one point, I had three soccer teams, two hockey teams, and I ran the Dallas Girl Scouts. Um, I was involved with all of those aspects of my kids. My husband was their coach, and he was an interventional cardiologist, so we were both pretty crazy. I had color-coordinated calendars on the wall back then. We didn't have smartphones. Uh, we didn't even have email at the beginning of that. And I had to call everybody's home phone and leave a message if a game schedule changed. So it was very time intensive. And I wanted to do that for my kids. So I focused on one and two. And that meant that I didn't do a lot academically. And I mourned that part of me um, because I had done a lot of stuff in my training and, and liked that. Um, and I did become a member of most of the organizations that were pertinent to my field, mainly to stay current. And it was a little break of, for my husband and I to get away to go to an ACC meeting or, or something and um, a break from the kids. So um, that was my first decade. And then lo and behold, the second day, decade, the kids are older. Our institution, I had learned a lot and I was like, I can make a lot of changes here that make us bigger and better. And so I started to advocate for those changes. It took me two years to convince my hospital to separate from the surgical leadership we had and recruit our own. And with that, I was became the medical director. And then when they recruited the surgeon and they gave him chief title, I go, wait a minute, why is he chief and I'm medical director? And they're like, well, that's just kind of what we do for surgeons. I go, but why? I do the same, if not more than him. I run this whole program now. And, you know, I say he quote unquote just operates as a as a snarky little comment. And they're like, well, we don't know. And so it was my saying, hey, it should be the same. That ultimately got me chief um, of the medical side of the transplant. And that's when I started to delve into volunteering for the organizations that I'd been members. They'd been on my my CV for years, but I'd only kind of gone to an occasional meeting. And so that's when I started to look into these organizations more. And so I started looking what was locally available. I started volunteering for, for writing work groups that I would see advertised out on the nationals. And I became we became so much larger once we I changed the way we did things that we were much more active in research trials. And I was able to actually start getting back into what I call the academic circuit. And so this is a very different pathway from those of you that are in more of that traditional model of going from your training to an academic institution, getting your grants, justifying your salaries. 
my salary was my E&M coding. I mean, that's how I practiced for the first decade. When I got to the second decade, I couldn't maintain that level and still do everything I needed as a chief. And so I negotiated a director salary or chief salary that could augment and offset um, the decline in E&M billing that I would need to do to do all of this administrative and academic work. And now um, the fruits of all that labor is that people don't even realize I was kind of gone from the scene for 10 years. I have collaborative relationships across the country and across the world. I was able to rise nationally um, into leadership positions. Uh, I was very a uh, big person for um, our allocation system. So I've been involved with UNOS for over 15 years, uh, part of developing the current allocation system, part of developing um, the new one. I was the chair um, and that started locally by representing my hospital in the Re regional review board, then getting nominated to be the region four representative, then getting nominated to be the ch vice chair. And then the, the board was a heart lung combined and it split. So I never got to be a vice chair because I was immediately thrown into the chair of the heart only committee um, when they separated. And now um, I'm the region four chancellor elect uh, to start this spring. Same thing with AST. I started by volunteering for some writing groups. I then um, applied to be on the COP and got on and then I applied to be the chair and I uh, started as the vice chair and then the chair suddenly left six months in. And so I got very little training and immediately was the chair for three years. Um, and so I've had all of these opportunities where I've just kind of, you, as been mentioned, you ask and you, you put yourself out there and then now on the AST board. And through these um, organizations, I have, developed incredible collaborative relationships to the point where a bunch of women getting together in our space started talking about, you know, the gaps that existed in um, our training and our relationships and our mentorship. And we organically formed uh, the Women in Heart Transplant and Mechanical I would never, if somebody had asked me, are you going to end up forming a not-for-profit group that works on networking women? I would have said um, no. Uh, but these these things happen when creative, talented, intelligent women get together. And I think that's what's so special about it. My family's now grown. I still don't have grandkids. Somebody, you know, please try and make that happen. Um, and uh, uh, my medical practice is... Um, smaller as I do more and more academically and administratively and, and have more and more time to dedicate. And my role now is to not have women try and figure it out as they go, which is what I did. I had no mentors. Um, and uh, the, my first and only mentor was Clyde Yancey, who got me into transplant because I was going to be a pediatrician. And, and so now I try and reach out all my early careers, men and women, I am asking, I meet with them on a regular basis. What are you interested in? What more do you want to do? How can I help you get there? Same with our residents. And I think that that's those of us in this stage of our career, that should be our driving force is helping the early uh, trainees and early career make those connections. So with that, I will stop and uh, be ready for questions. Wow, thank you all. Those are really honestly just so inspiring to hear all of your stories and uh, the authenticity that you all put into it uh, and to hear from just such different diverse backgrounds. So thank you so much. Um, there is a question in the chat, but I'm gonna kind of jump right into a little bit of a harder question first, right? Um, so from, you know, when, how do we, I think the biggest issue is self-promotion for women. And I think you all hit on that. So how do we teach women um, to self-promote? Like, how do you drown out the imposter syndrome that seems to permeate across specialties and ranks? As Vanita said, there's always, you know, you feel like you, you need to do more. So how, how do you teach yourself and how do you teach other women to do that? Who do you want to start? <laughs> Why don't you go? Uh, I, I think that I, I just watch guys. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I just say, what would a guy do? 
um, you know, they, there's well-published data that like for job applications, men will apply for jobs that they don't have the prior experience of the qualifying for, and they'll BS their way through, or they'll just think they can do it. Women have to make sure every box is checked and that they've done more than that before they'll even try. And so I, it's just like when I asked for the chief, um, title, uh, I saw the guy was getting it automatically. And, and I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. And again, it was surgical medical. It's not so much a man woman thing, but I just saw that. Yeah. So that's what I do. I, I, and my husband has been, he's a very um, powerful voice um, in the uh, politics of medicine. He just finished his presidency as TMA. And so I'd watch him and he, he actually has always advocated. I, I'm not the person I am before I met him. I was very timid and uh, he sometimes regrets the the monster he unleashed. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I watch guys and I see how they do it. And I'm like, OK, then, yeah, that's what I'll do. That's such great advice, honestly. Um, Benita and then Monica. Sure. Um, so Shelly, that's great advice. Uh, watch guys, watch other strong people who advocate for themselves and do it authentically. Um, so. I absolutely agree with you. I have a little bit of difficulty speaking up for myself. And the way I've tried to work around that, I'll share two things. One is to listen and believe in good feedback, good feedback. So when people give you feedback and so it's great, it's wonderful. It's Those are sort of qualitative just words. But if it's somebody that I'm comfortable with, know well enough or trust or somebody who's a mentor, tell me what what makes this good. Tell me what is it that I'm doing well so I can hear it, so I can, one, keep doing it. And two, if I have to speak for myself, now there's an external validation for something that I'm supposed to be good at, but in other people's words that I can yeah. embrace better. The other thing that's easier... Um, for those of us who have difficulty sort of speaking up or being authentic in their self-promotion is your written testament goes a long way. So once you've accomplished a body of work, write it down. It really brings out how much you have done to yourself first, because we forget all the little things we do along the way um, to Use that written testament. If you can't use the words to promote yourself or at least in your immediate division or your department level where you're going up for promotion, people really enjoy reading and learning about you. Um, build your CV, um, use it for promotion and tenure, creating your portfolios. I've also become a big fan of writing your own reference letters because it can be a great experience and reinforces everything you've done, sort of create and craft your own narrative. And the more you write it, the more it internalizes it, the more it's fluid when you have to reach in and speak about it. So those are a couple of other things. But Shelly, I want to be you. <laughs> I second that. I want to be Shelly. Um, I love that comment about the reference letters. I now ask all of my mentees to do the same because you really have to start training people to being able to speak in a voice that's authentic about themselves. Um, and it's so hard. It's so hard for self-promotion. But now, you know, as I'm sure most of us do, we'll get an invitation to speak or we'll get an invitation to moderate. And I'll just kind of like quickly discard it. I either will quickly be like, okay, well, that's great. You know, I'll put just put that on my calendar or I'll ask why me. But I won't just take the moment to pause and be like, good job. You just got asked to go moderate something. You just got asked to speak. So now what I do, I think similarly, Shelly, my husband has been, um, he's a transplant hepatologist, but he's really helped me to gain more confidence in myself. And I now have to share with him every time I get invited to do something, good feedback coming in, because it's sharing it with somebody and taking that moment to actually acknowledge like your worth. Um, and that you're deserving of that. You're deserving of that coming along. And I think the CV is so key because sometimes we don't update it until we have to because we're going up for promotion. So I really encourage too for my mentees. And so now I do it myself. Every time I get asked to do something, it goes onto my CV. So I'm updating and documenting it. And my division chief is an IBD specialist. So 
He's not in the same societies as I am. He's not reading the same journals. He has no idea what I'm doing unless I tell him, you know, when I'm coming up for promotion, of course, my CV will go to him, but I like to keep him like in the know about when I'm doing something that's impactful in my field. And so I think it also helps to just, you know, let your boss, you know, keep your boss in the loop when you have these really important accomplishments, but it's not easy. It took me so long to feel comfortable doing that. But back to the reference letter, I think one piece that helped me early on is all of my mentors made me write my own reference letters. That's such a really great advice and trick that we can use uh, starting right now. Um, I'm posting the second question and uh, you can take it, whoever wants to take it first, but knowing what you know about yourself, do you think what is the right time to go up for these big jobs, big promotions? Do you think you did it at the right time or you waited too long? Or how do we know it's now time for us to do the big ask? As Monica said, be bold. Um, when is the right time to be bold? I think it's so, yeah. it's, there's so many nuances depending on your institution. You know, at UCSF, it's very much like a boilerplate. You just move from one to another. Um, but I think it's really inquiring for the from the people who are your mentors and sponsors at the institution who actually understand the intricacies of this to be like, when am I actually eligible for this? Um, and while it's a boilerplate at UCSF, when I came on, when all of us came on back in the day, we were all assigned the wrong track. Like we were all just dumped into one track that didn't have any of you know the perks and whistles of other ones. And it wasn't until later that we learned about this and other tracks came with like, low mortgage rates for houses, like things that were like financial implications, other grant funding. Um, and, you know, that was a different time with a different chief, but it just, you've got to be your own advocate. And I think ask early, it's never too early to be like, reach out to the people who are mentoring you at your own institution to figure out what are the pathways and when you might be appropriate for um, an accelerated move and how that accelerated move is going to help you. For me, like, I didn't want an accelerated move because I have to pay my salary because I'm a researcher. So I have to pay the cost difference because I only get a set amount from the NIH. So there's also kind of strategy to go in there because if I get a salary raise, it means I have to do more clinical work, which means I have less time for clinical research. So um, that's another talk for another time. But yeah, it just depends on where you are, but ask early and ask the people who are really going to advocate for you. Um, mm, that's great advice, ask early. Um, Swati, um, I, one of the reasons I absolutely love ASD, American Society of Transplantation, is because like other organizations, this is also a organization that is run by professionals. It's for professionals. When I started in 07 as a fellow and joined ASD, we did not have COPs. COPs did not come into being until 2012, 2013. There were a couple of specialty groups like pharmacy and ID, but we did not have COPs. And we certainly did not have 17 COPs until the past seven or eight years. One of the beauties of having COPs is um, there's plenty of opportunities that are not, quote, seen, but they really are. So participating in a hub discussion repeatedly, people start to know you. Um, submitting, you know, when there's call for let's do program proposals for ATC or WTC, that's one of the things when I was um, LDCOP incoming chair and then my chair year, we really sort of net started networking across the COPs and creating opportunities for other members. And it really was because there are people who came up and said, I want to participate. I want to participate. All right, tell me what your interests are. Let me make a list. Olivia helped keep that list when we had our annual meeting of who's interested in what and what's going on and how do we connect people. The same thing, journal club, Twitters, multimedia work groups, bring your ideas forward. And guess what? If you put your head down, do some really good work for a little bit, people notice that. People are looking to promote other people for the most part. They will find you. Feel free to go up to your uh, board counselors, to the president, to the COP chairs, to the EC members. These are all people who get you into the door. And then really it's 
in the beginning, you may not know what you want to do, and that's okay, and you can align with whatever is there. Or you may have a specific initiative and focus, then look and ask for who is that person? Can I go hang with you? I just want to learn. I want to be with you. And from that, you will have projects. You know, you can be part of a research, of opinion piece, a viewpoint, a consensus conference. There's multiple ways to do it. And this is what ASD is extremely um, fertile and rich ground. Long-winded answer, but hope that is what you're looking for. The only thing I would add to those two things is I'm going to go back even further. You know, they've talked about the job path and the the nationals. I'm going to say it's your very first interview. Um, what is that like when you're interviewing for your first job? What is that like? Are you isolated to just, you know, a chair or a head of a department? Or is it a wide open table? Like when we interview somebody, they that applicant has time alone with the coordinators, God help us. Then they have, they're with the nurse practitioners alone, none of us in the room. They meet with administrators separately. They get, they meet with all the components of our team so that we're a very open book. You, you know, you can get twinges of what kind of culture you're going into by how your interview goes. And so I would say you start there. If you get a, oh, you know, you, oh, I want to meet so-and-so. I want to meet the person you hired last year. Oh, no, no, that's not part of the routine. Oh, is he gone? Can I have the, the, you know, the email? It, you can get hints as to, is this an open nurturing culture that's really for you and going to build you up? Or is this a different culture that may not be as, um, uh, full of mentorship as you you would want to be. So I would say it starts from from that point. And I just want to interject. I know it's not my turn, but what you just said, Shelly, I think I, I actually say that to residents and fellows too, you know, like the very beginning of your journey. Like if you don't get to meet the other residents and fellows and see how they interact with each other, that you're not doing yourself a, a service, right? Because the same thing that you said, that informs so much about culture more than anything else. And at that point, I do want to promote the culture of ASD that you all have pointed out. And there's a question in the Q&A that, that speaks to it. The website is very good. All the COPs are wonderful. Thank you guys for being the champions and making them so we can utilize them. But it has been very powerful for me to be part of the women's health community of practice. The kidney pancreas community of practice made a lot of connections. And um, the timeline for the WTC proposal is coming up. It's in one week, but we still have time. So uh, the attendee who wants to know how to get involved, please reach out. We can help connect you with people. Look at the website, see what aligns with you. And there's so much out there that can help you get started in your journey in the national committees. Siri, I think you have a question after this. Sure. Um, I have uh, kind of two related um, questions. Or in certain cases, you know, I think... Um, you know, what, what Shelley Hall had spoken about in the first decade, it reminds me, you know, when we're trying to start for my, for myself, for example, um, start our careers and, you know, I have a, a toddler at home. How do you know when to balance uh, trying to pursue these opportunities versus saying no to opportunities that present themselves and may not be aligned with your goals? Um, and how do you deal with people who may um, serve to discourage you from, from pursuing things that you feel are, are what you're meant to do. I mean, I'll comment on the timing in that there is no universal timing um, and it has to be when it feels right. Um, you know, if there's an opportunity to go, oh my God, I would love that. Then that's probably something you're going to try and, and, you know, move heaven and earth and get some additional help in your other aspects of life to try and make happen. If it's a, oh my God, they want me to do this, but God, if I don't do it, will this shut everything forever? Then that's something you really need to question, you know, and investigate further. It, if it doesn't light you up and you're only doing it because you think you have to do it, I'm testament for not doing it for 10 years that, that you don't have to do that. Um, and so it should, uh, to me, it should light you up as much as the rest of your life, because it's going to add havoc. The more things you add to your schedule, the tougher things are going to be. And so they better be things that are meaningful to you and worthwhile to you. And um, that's, that's how I ultimately did it. The other thing I'll comment about having kids, especially I think with the first kid 
is I just felt like um, my whole world, I had no time for anything. And I was never going to have time again to be able to accomplish things. I'm not going to be able to publish. I'm not going to be able to get grants. This is so hard. And, you know, I'm on the other side of it now with like 10 and, you know, almost a 13 year old. But I think just give yourself grace. Like that time is going to go by so fast and enjoy it. And don't feel like you're just going to be behind everybody else because you're missing out on all these opportunities. There are going to be so many opportunities that are going to continue to flourish and become available for you. And you don't have to do everything right away. I think I felt that the pressure of being like, I'm falling behind. I'm not keeping up with my colleagues, especially my male colleagues. You know, I have these kids at home and it just, I was putting so much pressure on myself and I couldn't do it. I naturally wasn't able to be as productive as I was during my years before I had kids. And I just wish I'd given myself more grace. And I would have enjoyed that time with my littles when they were little more. Um, so you're always going to have time. Your trajectory does not need to look like this. It will it may be here for a while while you have littles at home. And then you'll have many opportunities to let that grow. I think that's so important about grace. I don't think we ever do that enough for each other ever or to to ourselves. And I think Shelly, you said very importantly how you spend that first decade or so really, right? Embedded in your family before you kind of um, grew in your career. And I think you're right, that's okay because ideally this career is not 15, 20 years, right? I mean, maybe it shouldn't be like 40, 50 years. <laughs> like some of her well, I'll tell you, there was a, a comment <laughs> made by, by somebody that I looked up to um, that um, I was in a meeting um, in my second decade, I was in a meeting uh, with him and we had some time afterwards. And he said, you know, I always wondered what happened to you. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I remember you presenting at the AHA. I presented on beta blockers and reverse remodeling and heart failure, which is now on the board review course. And I was a resident back then. And he goes, I, he goes, I saw you present. He goes, I knew you were going to be something. And then you disappeared. And that was like a stab in the gut. And I said, well, I was raising five kids and had a very busy practice. Um, so yes, I had a little bit of a hiatus from the podium. Um, but that, uh, to me, if there's no other message for those of you who are wanting you know, academic and research work, it doesn't have to happen the minute you start your practice. And uh, as was said, the, the losing out on the time don't get me wrong. It was with five of them. There was plenty of chaos and there was never enough time with any of them, but, um, you won't get that back. Uh, yeah, I just add Celia. Um, gosh, this is such great advice from both of you, Shelley and Monica and Anjana. Um, Celia, um, the, the current uh, environment, especially for women, um, requires so much more mental labor than it's ever been. There is now the technology mental labor for arranging your kid's schedule and this and that and the other. And then there's the physical labor. And then you have to still do all the things you do at work and balance it all. So the timeline that somebody may set for you or the institution may set for you is a very different timeline from what the reality is. And I don't have children. Um, and we still, I still did not have the traditional timeline. Um, so you are the master of your own uh, destiny, if you will. Keep doing good work is what I tell myself and tell others around me, and it will eventually pay off. And as far as this, uh, you brought up another thing about what do you do about non-supporters or discourage, you know, people who discourage you. And a very poignant quote for me is, don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you don't belong, because you will always find it. So the idea is that our worth and our belonging are not negotiated with others. We carry that inside of us. And I know who I am and I will not negotiate with you because then I fit in with your world, but I do not belong to myself anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very powerful thing that resonates with me is just know your truth. Be brave to be yourself for the circumstances you have. And Anjana said it beautifully, our career is not 10 or 20 years. It's way longer than that. And what we were today will be different from what will be tomorrow. There is an article at New York Times. I don't know if you all saw. Is that what you were referring to, Vanita? The tightrope that women are walking? Yes. 
I think it's so telling on on every level, right? You probably live it almost every day, but thank you for that advice. Um, I think we're entering towards the end of the this this webinar. I want to thank our speakers for really showing your personal stories, not just the successes. Sometimes we forget how much effort it takes to get to the success and hearing your journey just empowers all of us to keep persevering. Ask early, keep asking, ask nicely, but get results. I think that's how <laughs> I want to lead. <laughs> Take my message and lead from there and just being sponsors. You guys have been so generous with your time, with your advice. You're always available. Uh, AST is a great hub for, uh, for people involved in transplant because as you said, some of our chairs may not understand what we do because it's such a niche job where we all know what it takes to transplant somebody and get good outcomes and, and maintain that. So thank you everybody for, for joining. Thank you, my co-panel moderators for keeping the, the chat going. And I hope we answered questions for everybody who was available. Should we not have answered anything, please reach out to us. We are always available. We are all willing to, to help. We want to help. We want to learn from you also. So please reach out and thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Thank you all. Thank you, Swati. I absolutely echo everything you say. That was a fantastic presentation. For all of our attendees, thank you so much for attending today. Um, as a reminder, we do have an evaluation survey that will pop up on your screen after the webinar closes. We just ask that you take this so we can continue to uh, produce some great webinars like this. Um, and I just want to thank you again to our panelists and our moderators and for sharing your stories today.